That worked. Come on up front, folks. We've got lots of uh, lots of room. The coffee is going to be there all morning, so you'll you'll have a chance to get back. And uh, but we do want to take advantage of the fact we clearly have critical mass, so we've got uh, so we do want to get started. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm uh, uh, I'm delighted you're here. My name is John Hamry. I'm the president at CSIS, and uh, this is a little different for us today. We've uh, normally we do big public events like this when we're done with a, with a study, and we're not done with this study. Uh, we've actually decided to, you know, depart from our normal practice a little bit and take, uh, take a study in front of an audience at a stage when we think we know where we're heading, but we still are looking for the kind of input and review that that uh, we need from all of you. So frankly, you're all here to work today. Uh, you're here to help us uh, think through, identify, discuss the issues inside this report. We, we're going to need that as we take this thing uh, the next step. So I, I want to say a, a, a sincere thank you to you. Um, I'm going to, I, I have not been involved in writing the report, so I'm free to say things, okay, because it's, uh, and I would like to offer a few just personal uh, observations this morning that I hope are not unrelated to the report, but probably go a little bit further than we do with the report. Um, and let me and let me introduce this by sharing a little a little story. I was uh, I was up I was the Deputy Secretary of Defense at the time when we went through a, a paranoid process that led us to shut down relations with China on on space launches, you know, and uh, had lots of very somewhat painful uh, experiences up on Capitol Hill, you know, and so we, that climate that existed at that time, well, about uh, two months after I left and I came uh, here to CSIS, I was invited to a dinner uh, with, uh, over at the National Academy of Sciences. And the reason is one of the people in our orbit was being inducted uh, as a lifetime honoree into the academy. And the, another individual that night was uh, the head of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And uh, just as things were, or luck would have it, I was seated next to this guy's wife, okay, so, uh, the Chinese guy's wife. And he, she didn't speak English. We had an interpreter, and so we were struggling through, you know, how to make conversation. And, but I did learn. Uh, during the conversation that she was the lead designer on the Long, long March ICBM. Uh, oh, boy. You know, I've just been deputy secretary. That's, we better change the subject here, you know? Uh, and so I said, well, how long are you going to be here in the United States? And she said, oh, we'll be here for a month. A month? Yeah, she said, we're going to be here a month. I said, where are you going? She said, we're going to Detroit. Detroit? <laughs> for a month? I mean, I... Uh, <laughs> You know, what in the world? And she said, yeah, she said, our son's a lead designer for Ford Motor Company. You know, and I thought to myself, you know, this is a little different than the world I had been living in. That where we have such a deep paranoia about uh, the Chinese on security grounds and then find the lead designer for the ICBM that we think has a nuclear warhead on it aimed at us, her son lives in Detroit. Okay, this is a more complicated world. And I, I, I bring this up to say that, um, you know, I spent 25 years uh, in government working on national security issues, and I, a lot of them working for Senator Warner. Um, and I, 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 to my day, I'll go to the grave wanting to defend this country. But we do not have a very sophisticated approach to industrial security and technology security. Matter of fact, we have a very inadequate approach. We have a very static approach, as though we can freeze in time a set of technologies, and they won't change because of our political preferences. If we don't, and it, that's failed. I mean, what, what did we do? I mean, we now have the most reliable space booster for commercial launches is in China. And yet we thought we were going to freeze them out so they could never move forward if we wouldn't work with them. Was that an intelligent 
security strategy? You know? Uh, I noticed when, when I was in government, we went through, uh, we, would, we were going through a painful discussion about, about letting American satellite manufacturers, imagery satellites, put up commercial satellites. And we said, well, we're not going to give you a license until you can prove that your competitors are going to be doing just about the same thing. Well, you know, what sense did that make? We, in essence, used regulation to guarantee a protected market to other countries before we'd let our companies compete. You know, is that a sensible security strategy? I mean, it's, it's as though our political preferences can control the evolution of technology. That's just crazy. Because we have this very static view of industrial security. You know, when we put in place the ground rules, you know, for today's industrial security, it was back in the 1950s. And it was a very important part of the strategy to win the Cold War. I have no complaints about that. But back then, uh, you know, because of the constraints of technology, your engineers had to be close to the factories so that you could work out the problem. So you could put in place a security system that was grounded on geographical borders. You could do it back then. But that's not today. I mean, today we're designing things on a global basis. So think about what we're doing. We, we put 100% inspection requirements on anybody that comes from China. We put a 2% inspection requirement on containers that come from China and a 0% inspection on electrons. I mean, this is, our paranoia is creating an incentive to move jobs to China. And yeah, again, because we haven't updated our thinking. We have these very obsolete ideas about security. We have this idea that security is static. We can freeze it. Well, you can't. We've got to develop a much more dynamic approach. So um, when we started this, uh, I said to David and the team, and again, I'm, uh, this, is, this is me talking here, so don't blame them for all what I'm saying here today. But this is part of a broader fabric, a much bigger fabric of how do we design viable security structures in the 21st century when you have such ease of movement of ideas and things and electrons and money and all of this can move so easily today and there's so much talent other places it isn't like it was in 1952 when 70 percent of the gdp of the world was in this country it's not like that anymore so we now have to design security systems that work in this age, not just carry over old models from the past. So the study that you're looking at, and you got to, as I say, you got to help us here today. We've outlined four different alternatives. And part of what we want to do today is to hear your thinking about this. How, what, what is the dynamic beyond our study group? You know, so we're getting the input from people around the community. Um, at, the, at the foundation still, and Senator Warner dedicated his entire lifetime, and it still does, to securing this country. But it is having a far more dynamic concept of security than we have had. And that's what we've got to do with the conference today. So, David, let me, let me get off the stage and to say thank you all for coming. I'm delighted to have you here. I think we've got a very important opportunity in front of us. As I said, we're about... 70% through this, uh, we're, we're at that stage, like I said, we don't normally do this. We don't normally take it to this stage and then invite the broad critique, but we think it's important to do it right now, and you're going to be part of that. Thank you all for being here. You. Glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pardon me while I move this mouse. It's not connected to anything, so it might give me the illusion of control. Uh, that I, uh, I want to thank you all for coming, obviously. Um, I would recommend that if you have a device that makes noise inadvertently, like a cell phone, uh, that you either turn it off 
or turn it up really loud so that we'll know who to blame when it goes off. And uh, I've tried to do that with mine. Um, I want to open up with a, a short story. Uh, it, almost 30 years ago, um, I was coming out of graduate school, and I was being recruited, uh, among others, by the Johnson Space Center and NASA uh, to go to work there. And I was invited to drive to Houston. I was doing my graduate work in Austin and be present in the command center for the first shuttle launch. So I arranged to do that. I think I spent $27 for a motel room, um, which on a graduate student's salary seemed like a lot of money at the time. And, uh, and got up early in the morning, got through security, got in. And of course, those of you who remember will know that that launch was scrubbed. And, and so it was a real signal of two very, very important things. One was that the government was about to fundamentally change the nature of the launch business. And the second was that you couldn't count on it. And uh, as it turns out, I, I didn't go to NASA. I'm sure that that event had nothing to do with my decision. Uh, instead, I went to DOD and I got involved in the industrial base business. And today, I feel like I'm almost right back where I was nearly 30 years ago. Uh, as Dr. Hamry said, today we, we are doing something that's a bit unusual for CSIS, releasing a draft report for broad public comment um, while our analysis is still ongoing. And we're here this morning first to walk you through uh, that whole process, to describe our next steps, to distribute a copy of that draft report to you, and then to take your questions. So what I want to do is get started and hopefully I'll answer a number of your questions uh, before you actually have to ask them. Uh, can I have the next chart? Everybody can hear okay? I guess if you can't, I'm not quite sure how I would know. Uh, but uh, anyway, this is, uh, th this is what our draft report does. Uh, it describes the importance of the commercial space sector broadly to U.S. national security. It catalogs a number of principal concerns about commercial access to space, which is the launch side of it. It lays out a series of options to address those concerns, and it gives you the framework that we've established for analyzing those options. What it does not do is present the results of our analyses, because in fact, that's still ongoing. So as a result, we have elements of this report that you might call findings, although we actually don't call them findings yet. Uh, but we really don't have elements yet that could be called recommendations although you can see uh, from Dr. Hamry's comments that we might occasionally be leaning in a direction that would, uh, uh, would illuminate uh, that. Uh, why we're doing it this way? Well, I'm going to touch on a few reasons as we go through this. So first, let me describe our methodology. Next chart. Um, it says all of our reports are uh, attempts to be an independent and objective assessment, and, uh, and ultimately we want a final report which does go out for public release. It builds on the work we did three years ago that was released in a report in February of 2008 on the health of the U.S. space industrial base and the impact of export controls. And I'll talk a little bit more about that study. We collected a lot of information through extensive interviews. They were all done off the record and not for attribution. I won't tell you whether anybody in this room uh, was participated in that process, but, uh, but we'll continue to do those. And we looked at virtually all the data that we could find or had uh, our arms around. Um, we focused on launch of medium to heavy payloads to geosynchronous orbit, because that's the real driver of both the, the um, overall dynamic and of the industrial base. And of course, we have the new approach of the uh, draft uh, for comment. So let me, I, I mentioned that we started, our starting point was actually our 2008 study. Let me quickly go back a little bit to that study. Next chart. Uh, you can't read this, and, and that's fine. Uh, you can find the, the uh, report on our website. It's a briefing, and actually, this particular chart takes like five charts in the, in the briefing, so you can go through it. But these are the findings, um, and, and you, can, you can, as I said, find that on our website. But overall, let me just highlight three key findings. One, we found that space is obviously critical to national security and the economy. That's no surprise to anybody. Uh, second, that all of the segments of the U.S. space community are highly interdependent, military, intel, civil, and commercial. Um, but that sometimes that interdependency is recognized by lip service, but not universally by integrated actions across all of those sectors. And finally, that the U.S. needs access to technologies 
but that increasingly those technologies are not coming from the U.S. That led us in the 2008 study to an extensive focus on export controls, which is not where we started. We started purely looking at the industrial base. And uh, you'll see that throughout the issues in that report. You'll also see it a bit in the draft today. And of course, that issue is back on the table again. I was talking with some in the audience beforehand about how these topics tend to follow a sine wave, right? There are times when everybody's paying attention to it and then they kind of drop off and you wonder what happened and then they come back again. And we're clearly uh, on the upside of such a wave right now. Next chart. We also uh, had a number of recommendations that tried to address the concerns that were underlying those findings. And, uh, and, and actually, the government has undertaken to implement a number of these recommendations. It's not our, our charter today to try to report on that, but it's, it's quite rewarding, obviously, when you're in a position such as we are. And our, our charter is to help uh, provide analytical input to important public policy issues and help move them forward. And you see that those are actually received on the other end. It, it, it makes it easier to, to get up in the middle of the night and come to work. Um, but it was clear to us that more was needed. And uh, that's one reason why we undertook this review of the commercial space launch at this time. Let me have the next chart. There's a second reason. As I mentioned, the sine wave effect, it seems like everybody's doing a review right now. There's a huge number of ongoing or recent completed studies and reports. Um, here, here's a partial list of the White House's uh, uh, national space policy under being written today. Uh, the ongoing space posture review, DOD, we had an interim uh, report out uh, uh, in March last month, uh, final report coming out at a date which, as far as I can tell, is still to be determined. Um, so part of the reason we scheduled this public release is, in fact, because of the timetable and schedule of these ongoing activities inside uh, and across the federal government. Uh, and our desire to fulfill our responsibilities to contribute where we can to those rather than wait until they're finished and then we come along and follow behind and and critique them. Uh, but there's a, a third reason we undertook this. Next chart. And that's because, actually, it matters. Um, so it's not just timing and it's not just follow on. It's actually pretty important. We call this chart two reasons why policymakers should care, but it's really our preliminary findings. Um, our overarching finding is that we concluded that national security depends upon commercial assets in space and that's widely recognized, but that current implementation of the policy of assured access to space does not adequately recognize or deal with that dependency. That's a critical, fundamental articulation, and we actually had trouble finding it articulated that way in any existing policy statement. You got plenty of commentary on the policy of assured access to space, plenty of recognition of the dependence on commercial assets, uh, for, that, uh, for that policy, but inadequate consideration of what it means of how we need to operate. And reflecting that overarching finding, I think our discussions and our data analysis yielded, in addition, seven areas of concern. Next chart. This kind of lays them out. We give a lot more detail on each of these uh, in the draft report. Uh, limited access to U.S. launch for commercial satellites has actually been one commercial satellite launch uh, in uh, uh, the U.S. in recent memory and none on the current manifest. We call that limited. You could actually use a stronger word than limited. Um, uncertain access, potentially, to, uh, to international launch providers. Things do get in the way. Um, a pretty fragile U.S. launch industrial base, especially when you get down to second and third tier uh, suppliers, where in many cases we have a critical technology and we're down to a single supplier and potentially a vulnerable one. Uh, increase in prices, not quite as clear there's an increase in cost. Uh, this actually um, is an interesting question. Uh, issues around payload security and uh, whether we can assure that for the future given developments in uh, uh, detection and uh, cyber. Uh, the potential consideration of a real catastrophic event or even a combination of catastrophic events. Um, I was down in uh, Pascagoula, Mississippi and I watched what a 30-foot wall of water did to Ingalls Shipyard. Um, and I think what a 30-foot wall of water would do uh, to Cape Canaveral, and it would take more than a day uh, to get anything back. Um, plus, of course, the catastrophic failure of a, of a uh, launch, plat uh, launch vehicle. Um, and then on top of that, you could look at each of those concerns and say, well, it's not so bad today. But you also have to look at the long-term implications and where that might go. 
um, and if the policies don't change. Let me have the next chart. So here's the structure of our study. Um, the first part talks about the overarching finding, the relevance of, of uh, commercial space to national security. The second looks at the current state of the market. The third is really kind of the heart of our report. We, and I, I'll go through each of these in more detail, so we're not going to cover a lot now. And that is a, a series of or, or sets of options for addressing uh, the concerns or, or improving access. Uh, the fourth part is the criteria that we'll use for evaluating those options, and the fifth is, is our next steps. Let me have the next chart. I apologize for the heat in the room. Uh, you're welcome to take off your jackets, and momentarily I may do the same uh, since this is uh, not being done for prime time. Um, I think we may, the weather may be changing faster than our HVAC can accommodate. Uh, when you go from 32 yesterday to 80 today, it's uh, a little bit troubling. Um, so this is the first part. We've discussed our finding already that commercial space assets are critical to national security. And, uh, and we found a, a fairly widespread thought, though, that somehow those assets are just going to be there when we need them. Uh, and that the government actually has limited responsibility uh, for e or even need for awareness of that. And look at the demand today just for bandwidth from commercial communication satellites. Roughly 80% of DOD's use is off of commercial assets. And in theater, OEF and OIF, it's reported in the open media as as high as 93 to 96%. And frankly, there's no intention by the government to go back to relying on solely government assets for those purposes. That's a widely recognized and potentially statable uh, reality. Um, but make no mistake about it. The access to what we're using today over Iraq, over Afghanistan, was neither carefully planned for nor deliberately made sure of. We were able to take advantage of the opportunity that was provided, and we certainly have. So that's an important element as we stand here. And in addition, of course, as I commented earlier, the sectors of space are interdependent. Let me have the next chart. This is just a, a representation of that, um, of, the, of the civil and defense and intelligence and commercial. And the key part, obviously, is the middle, uh, the common intersection of all of them. And we list some of the characteristics of, uh, of assets and capabilities that are co-located inside that, that intersection area. First, of course, is launch, second, communications on down the list, uh, including industrial base and technology. This chart's in the draft report. You'll be able to look at there. So if national security depends upon commercial space assets but doesn't fully recognize a responsibility for launching those assets, what does that mean? Well, to answer that, we started by looking at the current state of the commercial industry. Next chart. Part two of our study gives a lot of detail, not only on the market, U.S. and globally, but also on the federal policies and regulations and statutes that affect that market. So let me just highlight a couple of points. Next chart. The bottom half of this chart is uh, geosynchronous orbit satellites. You can see uh, both the left-hand side, which is history, the right-hand side, which is projections. It's been staying around 15 launches per year, ranging 10 to 20, and it's projected to stay in that range for the next decade. Next chart. But the second factor is that the U.S. share of that market is declining from over 60% in 1997 and 1998 to 30% today. This only goes through 2008. It doesn't reflect the financial crisis 2009. Those data are not fully um, uh, absorbed yet. Uh, I suspect when we get the 2009 data, that trend will not have changed. That trend line will continue to go down. Next chart. Because here you see the same declining share, and you can't really read the numbers. But I just call your attention, on the left side, the U.S. is the big blue 75 percent, and on the right side, uh, it's 25 percent and still declining. So if U.S. national security and the economy depend on commercial space assets, and the U.S. role in the global market is declining, and the government is under-recognizing that situation or its roles in addressing it, what are the options? Next chart. That's our third part of the study. We looked across the band of options that we found someone inside the government or nearby um, had put on the table for consideration as a way of dealing either with this issue directly or 
there was a tangential impact on these issues uh, from those options. And we arrayed those options into four sets. We did that for three reasons. One is we want to evaluate those options against a common set of evaluation criteria and see what elements of each one make sense. The second is we're putting them out now to you and the broader community uh, to make sure we're not missing something or mischaracterizing something. And the third is we want to make sure that the ongoing studies underway today are aware that there are multiple options available and they don't rush to conclusions and decisions on the more narrow option set that each one of them might be looking at. Um, because if you don't know all your options, you're likely to pick whatever's handy rather than whatever's best. Next chart. These are the four sets of options, uh, leveraging foreign launch providers through partnerships, through changes in government policies, um, encouraging competition, which requires a number of changes uh, inside the U.S. as well as uh, potentially interaction globally. The opposite of increasing competition, which is increasing the government role. Uh, essentially, instead of competition, have the government do more. And then lastly, changing the dynamic by changing the demand. None of these are particularly easy. They're all fraught with peril. Um, uh, and the re report has quite a bit of detail on, on each of these. Uh, I'll be glad to go through them in more detail in the uh, question and, and answer period. Next chart. So the final element of our analysis, part four of the report, um, was to lay out the criteria for assessing and evaluating uh, those option sets. And they cover five areas. Next chart. Reliability, security, affordability, feasibility, and timeliness. So our draft report defines each of these in detail, describes sub-elements of evaluation so you'll actually see what we're measuring against. Uh, these are not hypothetical or ideological criteria, but actually analytical ones. Um, and it describes how we'll assess the option sets against each of one of these. So as with the options, we lay these out in case we're missing something, you'll help us identify and rectify that. Next chart. So what are our next steps? Uh, we'll release this report. Uh, we'll seek comments. We've set up a website. We've sought uh, opportunity for uh, providing uh, input, and we will uh, acknowledge and accommodate each of those. Uh, I suspect uh, we'll divide the comments into the spurious and the serious, and what the boundary line is between those will depend on whether we get 10 or 10 million. Um, I don't expect 10 million, but uh, I've told my staff, I said, you know, I, I used to work for the government. And so I'm, I'm very familiar with the, the government's approach to uh, comments, um, which is thank you very much uh, for your contribution. Our, uh, we've done a careful assessment, and we've concluded that our existing uh, path completely accommodates all the important elements of your comment. Um, some of you may have been on the receiving or the sending in of a similar message at some point in your career. Um, I particularly used to do this with members of Congress, but I was much more attempted to be much more subtle. I suspect it did not come across that way. But uh, meanwhile, and so we, we're going to be open for comments, uh, and, and obviously for the significant issues that come up, uh, we look forward to meeting with people, to going through detail, acquiring more information, et cetera, wherever possible or useful. And meanwhile, we're going to continue our fact-finding and our analysis, evaluating the options, refining as needed, um, meet with those who have more to offer, and put out a final report uh, by the end of June. Uh, next chart. Uh, here's the address for the comments. Uh, the report will be on the web at the conclusion of this. It may already be on the web. If anybody's got a wireless connection, you can uh, check and see. Um, and, and so we'll be ready to go. Uh, at this point, I would like to acknowledge uh, the contribution that the, the folks on my team who made this possible, uh, the ones both in the room uh, and not. Um, uh, and I, I would like you, actually, if you all would Stand up when I call your name because I really want to call you out on this in an acknowledgement kind of way. It also let me see who's not here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I teach school in my spare time, and I like to find subtle ways to take role rather than make it obvious. No, uh, no, I seriously, the amount of effort and the, the, the contributions the team made on, on this uh, report, uh, and I'm sure I'll overlook somebody in this process, uh, was just phenomenal. We've been in a very hard run for four months on this and, uh, and have covered an awful lot of territory quite thoroughly. Um, so um, uh, Tara Callahan, Lindsay Omit, you can go ahead and stand up with your uh, laptop or wave your hand. 
uh, Tom Patterson, uh, Greg Sanders. If uh, Greg is here, that means it's on the web, right? Great. Um, Stephanie Sanok, uh, Gary Powell, Brian Green, uh, Josh Hartman, and of course my deputy director at the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group, Guy Benari. He's not here today. He's actually headed out to uh, uh, Seattle uh, to do an industrial plant tour. And most importantly, my co-project director, who will join me up on stage is here afterwards for the questions, Greg Kiley. Um, I would uh, like to extend my personal thanks to all of you for your contribution here. I wouldn't be up here today uh, if not for the work you've done. So that concludes our presentation. Here's how we'd like to proceed. We have copies of this draft report available. Um, what I'd like to do is take a break, let you get your own copy. I think they're right outside, Tara, is that right? Um, I would really ask you to take one copy each, no, not more than that, please, um, because uh, otherwise we'll, we might run out. And, uh, and then we'll reconvene and take your questions. So with that, let's take a break, get the report. Thanks. Twenty-two minutes. About right.